Good afternoon, everyone. So as we realized in the keynote this morning, the community at large is producing some amazing open source projects. We've got new innovations constantly happening, new projects constantly updated, hitting their 1.0 releases. And this is awesome. Everything is awesome. But also on the flip side of this, from a user's point of view, it can feel overwhelming. It can feel a lot of information being thrown at us constantly. And this is why it's super important that all of these projects and open source in general has awesome documentation. And that is what I'm hoping to share with you today about how documentation can transform a project and make it easy for people to get started and have an impact on how that adoption can help. And so my name is Ben Hall. I am the founder of Catacoda. Catacoda is an interactive learning platform for software developers. And so um, directly in the browser, you get given an interactive environment which has been pre-configured um, with all the various tooling, so Docker, Kubernetes, OpenShift. And alongside that, to guide you, you get a step-by-step -step tutorial, and so you can learn and follow along and solve uh, real-world problems. And you may have seen us on um, the Red Hat stand downstairs, which are using Catacoda, and the Kubernetes website um, have Catacoda embedded in order to help bootstrap and kickstart people's experience. And as I said, the aim of this talk is to discuss and share some of the experiences which I've had and some of my uh, uh, kind of viewpoints on how documentation can, tra tra can transform a project and how it can go through and make a user's adoption easier and as such, more your projects more successful. And while my focus will be on open source, we are at Cloud Native Con, um, the same patterns and the same approaches apply, whether it's an internal API for your internal dev teams, whether it's a commercial product, or whether it's a side project which we're working on um, and hopefully will turn into a larger thing at the end of the day. All of these techniques can be applied in exactly the same way. And so documentation is a huge area. And so it can be very difficult to understand where to begin and what to focus on and where to spend your efforts. And so Sam Newman, who's an um, awesome leader within the microservice community, did a very timely tweet um, very recently. And then to hear his viewpoint and his definition is that, well, creating resources and creating projects is amazing. It's our responsibility as creators to also give guidance and give explanations about how those projects should be implemented. It's important that we're not just producing the toolings, but we're also making sure that people are getting the best experience. They're getting the appropriate experience. We're not just sending people down a blind path and misleading um, configurations, which will end up hurting them um, later on. And this is where documentation can help ensure that people are getting this great experience based on how we, through creators, think the tooling should be used. And the problem with documentation, at least within the development and technical sector, is a lot of the time we assume that people will just be able to read the code and understand exactly what the code is doing and then as such how it should be implemented. And so this was another great timely tweet where historically a lot of the initial documentation was just read the tests or just read the code and understand what it was doing and how it works. And this is a fundamental barrier for people to start implementing projects and getting started. If they have to understand what the code is doing, this is that burdens. If your code is not correctly um, created, doesn't have to write, um, it could be a different format. And it can really make a, a barrier for people going. And with so many different projects and so many different implementations, it's also very easy for people just to go to the next project or just close the tab and just move on to something else. And the general vibe, and I like a lot of the documentation which we saw, can be summed up by this awesome diagram. Um, which I'm sure many of us have seen, but the premise being that we expect people to simply install um, X technology and then be able to successfully run it in production at scale as if we were Google. And the reality is we need, we need, to, have, um, we need to have much clearer guidance. We need to help people get from being able to install it to up to running at full scale. And so instead of expecting people just to jump straight in, our documentation and our approach needs to be building on expertise. We need to give the right information at the right time to make people successful and not overwhelm them with complexity, with confusing um, information, with too much technical information too soon, because this will just be confusing and demotivating when it doesn't make sense or the user can't understand. And so instead, by, by providing information in a piecemeal way and building up that knowledge, we can get them to the end goal. We can get them to that 
great experience of how the product works and how the product operates without completely overwhelming them. And in our experience, the documentation begins long before where most people focus on. Most people focus on creating developer portals and making sure that the reference API documentation is perfect. But the reality is documentation starts way before that. And it starts and it's attached much more closely to the user experience. And so if we spend time taking a step back and looking at how users actually adopt products um, and adopt new toolings and new ideas, there's five key stages. They'll go through an exploration, like this is a new awesome technology, what does it do? Like what problem is it solving? And then they'll try and use it, they'll experiment, see how it works, how to get started. If it does actually solve problems, what problem does it solve? And then eventually get up to the point where they need reference and they need um, that expertise. And these five stages map very cleanly onto what an emotional journey looks like from a user's point of view. So how um, people will actually engage with projects. So there's a technology trigger, i.e. a new project was just announced on Twitter, or a keynote like this morning announcing something like Core DNS. It's like everyone's super excited. It's like, ah, this could be the answer to all of my dreams. And so instantly they'll get into this uh, expectations, and it will be probably a little bit over-egged compared to reality. And so when they try and use technologies and try and implement it, they'll start getting disillusioned. It'll be too much trouble. The code samples will be broken. The examples aren't um, detailed enough. And they'll start getting disillusioned. And it's not the answer to the dreams. And they'll potentially move to something else and try a different technology. But if users can get beyond that, then they'll start to see the goal. They'll start to see where the project sits and they'll start being productive. And this is the aim, and this is where we want to make sure that people get into within our documentation journey. And so these five stages map very cleanly onto this kind of emotional curve that users are having too. And so when we're thinking about the types of documentation which we want um, to produce and how we want that documentation to work, we want to be making sure that we're providing the right information which maps this journey about how people are experiencing and uh, learning more about the technology itself. And so I just want to start by going into some more of these stages in more details. So let's start with the exploration. And fundamentally, at this point, users are like, why should I care? Like, why is this project important to me? And at this point, they're confused. They may have seen a tweet, 140 characters, doesn't go into much detail, or it may have just been mentioned in a talk, and it's like, OK, I'll look at that later. And so they need some more information. And while awesome technologies are great, it can be confusing when people land on new websites. So this is an example of Docker. Well, Docker has completely transformed our technology industry and done some amazing work. When you go onto their homepage, the first thing it's discussing is Kubernetes. And from a user coming in blind to the container ecosystem, this is somewhat confusing. Not only do they not know what Docker is, but they're also now being introduced to the concept of Kubernetes, which is more things they have to understand. And as you navigate for, through more of Kubernetes, uh, for more of the Docker website. They introduced case studies, which is great, but again, it's not really explaining what containers and what Docker are. And then they'll drop people into the, like, the far end, like how do you contribute back to Docker, but contribute as something called Moby, like what's Moby, what is Docker? And so this journey can become extremely confusing from a user's point of view. And again, this is why I think documentation starts really early on in the journey, because this is all forming into a user's perception about how the project works, and how um, they can start adopting it and using it. And so if you look at some other projects, which I uh, think are really good, strong examples, Kubernetes. So it's very clear instantly what the purpose of Kubernetes is. It's production grade container orchestration. And so instantly you know whether this is something which you're interested in or something which is not for you and you can move on. And the same as you're going through it, it's a very clear tagline, it's got some good explanations, and then it's telling users where to go next. I, in this case, uh, try the interactive tutorials. So users know where they're expected to go and how that journey is expected to flow. Very similar with uh, Project Caligo and Tidic Gira, it's very clear what that project is there, what's the purpose of why it exists. And again, again for using either how to get started or where they can go for a demo and more information. Same with Terraform, again, great examples, so clear taglines, very strip, clap, uh, strap lines, and giving people the pointers in a very clean, direct way. And so when people are motivated and they're excited and they want to explore more, they know instantly whether it's relevant for them and then where to go next. And this is something which we uh, should be aiming for. And even complex things like Google still manage to have 
key touch points, like using Google core infrastructure, machine learning, and using all of the great buzzwords to get people excited, but still telling people how to go and where to go next. And so once we get people over this initial barrier, like this is a project which I should be paying attention to, we want them to get started as quickly as possible. And what we want to demonstrate is answering the question, like, do you actually solve my problem? If we're looking at something like Calico, it's like, cool, secure networking. OK, is that the problem, or uh, is that the answer to my secure networking problems, or is there another um, vendor which I should be looking at? And there's many barriers which people put in a way in order to make this what should be a very awesome, exciting experience for the user, somewhat problematic and having lots of barriers in the way. Um, the one which I personally enjoy is, here, download this 10 gigabyte virtual machine image um, in order to have a demo of how my product works. And like, this is fraught with danger. If you think that you're in somewhere like Australia, 10 gigabytes is a significant amount of data to download. Even in central London, 10 gigabytes will still take you an hour um, to download. And then it's a VM, so how do you run that? Like, are you going to start introducing and teaching people about Vagrant, teaching people about Hyper-V, KVM? Like, how does that work? And so there's all of these other questions that the user is going to be um, engaged with when they just want to simply figure out whether your product is what they need or not and to help them get started. What we see more of and more frequently is deploy using CloudFormation or deploy using Azure or Google. Again. Now you have to start explaining how to use CloudFormation, or how to use a particular cloud vendor, and at the same time hoping that users forget, uh, remember to turn off the machines at the end of it, and they don't get this unexpected invoice for $300 when they, all they wanted to do was figure out whether they wanted to use a product or not in the first place. And so these types are asking for people for a huge amount of commitment up front before they've actually even proven or been shown whether the problem is right for them or not. And so there's a few techniques which we find are beneficial when we're training people and getting people started um, that help with their adoption and help people understand what the product offers. With Kubernetes and the work we're doing with the Kubernetes team, um, we've got the Catacoda interactive test drive. And so people can start Kubernetes, a start Kubernetes cluster in the browser. They don't have to download anything. They don't have to install anything. They can start deploying containers and just experience what it looks like and how it works and how it operates. We see it with other Kubernetes projects as well, so the uh, people from Hiptio and with Cosnet. And so you've got the JSONnet code um, defining a Kubernetes cluster. And then live in your browser, you can tweak it and edit it and see instantly the transform YAML. And so you can start putting together and exploring how this new approach works and whether it's right for you and whether it's something which you're interested in. And for me, this is all part of getting people um, excited and motivated and understanding where the product sits, which is the whole purpose of documentation. Another great example is Stripe. So Stripe is a payments gateway, very API developer driven. And so the first thing you get and experience when you go into their documentation site is a code snippet, and then it walks you through and gives you information. So it tells you what you expected and what's going to be required of you when you're implementing the API. But it will then also give you kill commands. And so you can execute these kill commands locally and actually experience and interact with the live API. And so this will then, um, in this case, uh, create a customer. And you'll see that customer created on the journey. And then you can go through and simulate creating card payments. At the end, um, once everything's successful, within five steps, you've gone through the entire Stripe API integration journey. You've made live API calls. And then it tells you where to go next. Like how can you continue being successful? How can you continue pushing forward and keeping that motivation and that energy about learning this technology alive? And so it's a really nice example um, of well, how you can demonstrate APIs in a nice, clear way. On the flip side, it does also still introduce barriers. Like it's got a dependency on curl. Like what if I don't have curl available? What if I'm on my iPad or if I'm on my mobile? I still want to be able to go through that great journey and take the documentation but I now have this dependency in this blocker. And so as you're introducing these different elements, it's important to think about the context about where the user is at that time and what the user will be doing. Yes, most people will have curl, but it's something else which they need to consider. And so there could be alternative ways to solve that problem in a much simpler um, experience from the user's point of view. But the premise and what we're trying to get to at the end of this kind of initial getting started stage, that initial five minutes where people are trying to learn and experiment is 
you want to showcase what your product is offering, showcase what it can do, and kind of allow users to experience that and allow them to prove for themselves that this is something which is worth um, continuing and worth um, exploring some more. And this gets us on to the point of kind of the onboarding. So now we start getting to the, into the more of the traditional longer form documentations. And this point as a user, like they've been shown what it does, and so now historically they want to explore more. They want to start using the product, interacting with it, and they need some support and documentation in order to be able to do that successfully. And ironically, in my experience, the best documentation is the documentation which we don't have to write. If we don't need to write long explanations, long detailed blog posts, or long detailed guides to help people, then all the better. And fundamentally, that's because people just don't really read on the internet. Like, historically, we're always skim reading, we're always glancing, we're distracted, we've got multiple different tabs open. And so it's very hard for people to concentrate and read and digest these long-winded, um, very detailed, uh, long-form documentation guides. And so there's different ways that we can break that up. And we're very fortunate by writing technical documentation about the tips and tricks that we can use. Obviously, code snippets are a great example. Developers will stop and read and digest a code snippet much more easily than a paragraph of explanation defining how to implement something. One thing which we, or which I personally get really frustrated by, is half-completed code snippets. So with this, it's a great example. It's very clear, it's very well defined. It's got even some nice comments. But if I took that and tried to run it in a Golang Rebel, it wouldn't work because it doesn't include the additional functions, the import statements, all of the additional information that one needs in order to be able to experience to its full extent. And so it's important to kind of think about how you can include all of this noise and this additional information without overloading the user, without it being too complex. And so what we're seeing a trend of is people having buttons or show hide toggle, and so that when you have your code snippet, by default it's all hidden and it doesn't have the additional import statements, doesn't have the additional function definitions, et cetera. But if the user wants to go ahead and execute that, they can very quickly just discover it with a button and have that information there. And so they don't have to go off and discover and look around um, for additional bits of information. So this, we think, is a really nice technique. We're also seeing more and more uh, integrations with APIs. So Spotify redeveloping their developer portal. And so now, it, as part of their documentation, they're getting people to authenticate, authenticate and gain an access token. Once they've gone through and they've authorized and they've got the access token, they then update automatically all of the code snippets which uses that live, real person's personalized access token. And so when users are going through, they're copying and pasting, they're trying to execute the code, they don't have errors, they don't have weird um, things which don't work. They get great experience out of the box um, without having to change anything. And so as we're building these documentation and these code snippets, sometimes we hit problems and we hit errors where it's actually just very difficult to explain. And it's very difficult to describe accurately how something works. And we've had, I'm sure, many of its experiences with doing things like installing Kubernetes. Kubernetes is somewhat of a complex thing to get set up and get installed. Hence why we have awesome tooling like Tectonic and OpenShift and all of the Google managed um, services. But also, it's a highlight that there is a problem. There is a missing gap within the workflow that developers are experiencing about how they're going around and how they're getting Kubernetes set up. And so a great example is work, work which the team have done around Kubeaddle, where instead of writing these long-formed uh, explanations and documentation about how you get it set up, they have built a tool which will do it for them. And so instead of trying to document the missing UX experience, they've wrote and they've automated that for people to get started with. And so now, as people are experiencing it and as people are going through, it's more of a self-documenting, clear definition about how users can get started. They can go in, they can type to kubeaddle and knit, and that will do all of the legwork and all of the hard work for the developer, which also means we don't have to document all of the hard work which is happening underneath. So once people have got uh, started, they've started to experience the product, they understand, they're motivated, they want to learn more, we get into the stage of guidance and discovery. And so this is now where people have 
um, ideally solved a problem or they've identified that this is a potential solution, and they're now exploring and looking at what other problems can be solved. What other, document, uh, what other problems um, does that solution offer? And this is where you start getting the more traditional longer form documentation, which is very focused on particular problem spaces and get, can get very niche. And this is also a great opportunity to start promoting and highlighting things which are happening within your community. Writing documentation solely from a team is hard work. It's time consuming. It takes a long time to produce very good detailed documentation. And also, it can be hard to discover all the documentation which is required. And so what people like DigitalOcean are doing is leaning on their community and promoting all of the awesome work, all of the awesome ideas that the community has, and then showcasing that as part of their documentation. And this then produces how people can get started. And so when you're searching for things like how do I run Prometheus on Ubuntu, the chances are that you'll land on DigitalOcean because that's got the best documentation in Google and as, as such, it's ranked more highly. And they respect the community and they respect the contributions. And so now there's over 17,000 um, different tutorials created and DigitalOcean will uh, compensate people when new tutorials are accepted and added in to the catalog because they respect that community effort. And so it's a really nice way to start reaching along more of the long tail documentation and long tail of guidance and discovery that people may be looking for because the community has probably been there and done that already. And a really great way to foster this and help is by having things like writer's guides and defining what's expected from a contributor. How do people get started? How can people start writing and sharing content with the product and with the company? And so this is a really nice way. Um, we're seeing this with um, some of the work that Red Hat team are doing um, with the portal. And so um, as part of the Evangelist works, all of this is on GitHub. It's all very open. And it creates that learning pathway about how users can go ahead and experience um, OpenShift and what different problems it can solve um, in an interactive way. And so as part of this, because people don't read on the internet and because people can't uh, focus on long form text. Everything's broken down into these step by step processes and more of a bullet point, um, very clear headings, very clear signals about what the user's expected and how they can actually go ahead and solve different problems. And as you're starting building these awesome documentation websites, it can lead to a problem around discovery and how do people find where all that valuable content is. So, something which I was super impressed with is from Twilio. And so, when you go into their docs website, it asks you two questions. What's your coding language? And what product are you interested in learning more about? And so you can go through, you can select Node.js, and then uh, select something like SMS or phone calls or um, voice over IP. And then it will take you to the appropriate getting started guide. And so instead of going through huge amounts of links and um, indexes about where documentation is, instead users can just jump straight into the getting started for the product and for the problem in their language and in their context, what they're familiar with. And so it's a really nice workflow about how you can um, have lots of different content and make it very easy for people to find in a very easy way. Another approach which Google has done is having a single page which then has examples in all of the different languages. So in this case, um, this is uh, their BigQuery uh, API. And instead of having different pages, so a page for PHP, SDK, a page for Go, a page for C Sharp, They've got a central point where people can navigate to and discover the required documentation. And then they can flip between the different examples based on what their language is. And so it makes it really easy for people to get started and see the differences between different languages that they may be implementing their technology in. And once we start getting to this point, we start getting to the traditional reference type material, i.e., how can I start becoming an expert with this product? And this is generally the documentation which we generally start writing first. It's the one which is focused more on the long tail. It defines all of the different API uh, events, different API calls. And we can use templates such as one from Stripe and read the docs in order to highlight and showcase that. But we also want to see about how we can make that fun and make that uh, learning experience um, more interesting from a user's point of view. And so instead of it being locks of blocks and traditional ways of documenting methods, uh, companies, again, using Spotify, an example, make it more interactive. And so they are helping people explore and understand what's being offered by the API in an interactive way by having an API console. And so people can 
use uh, real data or they can fill in some sample data automatically and start interacting and exploring the API that they're trying to get um, more information about. And then obviously under the covers, they've got um, the longer form traditional guide if people do want to know what all of the uh, API calls are, um, all of the API calls are, um, and the methods which are possible. And so that for me is how a user's journey maps from them getting familiar with the product and kind of becoming familiar and then getting to the stage of where different types of documentation fit into the user's different mindsets. But what about readmits? Like GitHub is now a huge source of information and a huge central place where people go to explore and discover what's possible. And so the readme is now equally as important as a user's a product homepage, for example. And for me, the readme is all about signposting. It's about giving people just enough information that they can be productive and they know where to go and where to find out more information. And it's really important because the readme sets the tone for the entire project. It sets the tone about what is considered important, how much effort has gone into the project in some cases, and whether it's being maintained or not. And it kind of gives you that initial instant experience about whether this is something which you're gonna build confidence and trust and build on top of, or it's something which you may um, not have so much faith in. And so again, if you use Kubadom as an example, it's got some great signposts. It's got um, information about where to go for support and how to get started. Um, it's got some information about roadmaps, et cetera. But it doesn't really tell you how to install it. It doesn't tell you where to get started, how to um, push forward. And so, because it's open source, there is a pull request pending, which I will submit. Um, but generally, in my honest opinion, um, this is what I kind of look for when I go onto an open source project. These are the kind of touch points which I'm generally interested in understanding more about. So obviously, what are the goals of a project? Why does that project exist in the first place? Why did someone invest time and effort in creating it? Because that's an important thing for people to, or for me to understand. And then, like, how do I install it? How do I get started? Do I need a package manager? What kind of APIs do they, do they require, et cetera? And then starting to get productive and actually use it. And because it's very open source and we want to encourage that community, giving people an indication of the status. Like, is this being actively developed on or has it been um, put into maintenance node and we're no longer pushing forward with it? And then, of course, things like contributor guidelines, code of conduct, so we're building a good, strong, solid open source project and then the license to make sure that everyone is happy. And so a really good example of this is Minikube. It's um, a great explanation at the top about why Minikube exists and how or what problems it's solving. It tells every people there clearly, given an operating system, this is how you install it. And then it moves on to a quick start guide. So it tells people, right, once you've got Minikube installed, this is how you start deploying pods, creating clusters, etc. And then finally, it's summarized with um, hints about how you can get more information, push it into advanced segments, contribute to guidelines and the community um, as well. And so it's really nicely formed that at any point, no matter how experienced you are or inexperienced you are, when you go into Minikube, it has all of the information which you need in order to be productive and, and make sure that you're making the right decision. It's a really good technique, which I think are sometimes overlooked when you're thinking about README, is that you have the ability to include images, which are always great, but you can also include GIFs. So this is an example of um, a GIF which will uh, deploy OpenShift and then start deploying pods um, and start deploying services. So again, it's a nice way for people to get um, an understanding of where that project fits in a nice interactive way. But we also don't want to start overloading and putting too much information into the readme because that can make more noise and more confusions. And so we can use um, a details element to start hiding links and hiding examples behind a dropdown. And so instead of having all of these examples and next steps um, within the mainline text, they can be hidden. And so if users want to find it and they want to know more, then they can, but by default, we're not overloading them with too much information. And because we're on GitHub, it's important that we start thinking about how we can foster and how we can start encouraging a community. And so by having the docs in a separate website or a separate repository, it makes it a great place for people to know and understand how to start com contributing. They know exactly where they need to go, and it's not being, um, it doesn't have the noise and the other conversations happening around the actual core project. 
And so Docker is a really good example, as is the Kubernetes website and the documentation. And so people know and they can start contributing. They can start raising issues and improvements um, if they want to without getting um, the rest of the noise about what is happening in the proposal. And this also starts you having more focused communities, things like the special interest group around the documentation and the doc sprint, which happened yesterday, is a great example of how, with this focus energy and this focus community, you can start pushing docs forward in a much more interesting, passionate way. And finally, what we want to do is start making it easy for people to give back and give feedback and share. If they notice a typo, if they notice a mistake, making sure that they can actually highlight that to the team, making sure that that can be improved for everyone else in the community. And so within Kubernetes documentation, every page has an edit button which takes you to the relevant part in the GitHub repo and so that people can start easily making changes and making um, suggestions about how it can work. The one issue I do have with this is we need to start thinking about like how does that work from a user who doesn't understand Git or doesn't understand GitHub and like introducing concepts of pull requests and forks and um, other, con uh, other aspects can be too overwhelming, especially when you just want to say like it should be uh, a small typo needs to be fixed. And so instead of people pushing people to, down a path of fork in the repo and making change directly, what we've started doing with our docs are people pushing and encouraging more people to submit issues and just highlighting the fact and then one of the community team members can go ahead and um, make the fix directly and we don't have to worry about contributor guidelines or um, a good license agreements, et cetera. And so these are some of the tips which we've experienced and which we find personally valuable and what we have found valuable when we've been uh, promoting products and encouraging other users to get started in all of these new shiny technologies. But a common question is, who creates the best documentation? Like we've seen lots of different examples of things which I like and things which I find um, beneficial and what users find beneficial. But who does the best? And this is a hard question because every documentation is different and every project has different objectives. But an interesting one is when you start looking around the community and start seeing what other people's recommendations are. And so there's an awesome blog post by Cristiano uh, Betta in London about the developer experience lessons from Lego. And this is not something which you generally look at as a source of uh, inspiration for technical documentation. But Lego is the perfect example of what awesome documentation looks like. It's very simple and straightforward about what you're trying to achieve from the outset, i.e. you're building a car or you're building a plane. It doesn't tell people to start from just here's one Lego brick and there's the end result. Instead, it's building up people's confidence. It's showing all the different stages at the right point, at the right detail about how people can be successful. And so instead of overloading them with information, it's just providing just enough that they can make the next step and the next leap forward. And it's also very good at promoting the community. It's very good at fostering new ideas. And so if there's a particular Lego set you'd like to see, you can go on and you can submit an idea. And if it gets enough votes, then Lego will produce it. And Lego will actually create a Lego set, um, in this case, around Red Dwarf. And because it's been designed in this way, it allows people to be very creative. It gives people enough support and enough ideas that they can build whatever they want, which is the whole purpose of people um, using Lugin in the first place. And this step-by-step -step nature has allowed people to get to the point where they can do awesome things like build, um, build elephants or build entire um, parts of America. And so I think that's a great example of what we can look for when we're thinking about the documentation and thinking about what we need to do and how much detail we need to go into is how would Lego do it? And so with that, I'd just like to summarize. So when we're thinking about the art of documentation, it's important to make sure that we're giving the users the right information at the right time. So how can we not lead them down a the path of, here, just install this thing, and now go ahead and draw the rest of the owl? Instead, we want to make sure that we're giving them the right bits of information. And then we, this needs to be done as people start um, engaging and start using the product, and as they start adopting it, their emotions change, and as such, we want the documentation to be able to change with that and provide them longer form documentation as they want to start being more productive and start being more of an expert with it. It's important to think about what are the forms we can provide. Like, can we start doing more interactive elements, adding things like 
um, what we're doing with Katakoda or API sandboxes like with Spotify in order to give people a better experience about how they can explore and how they can start playing. And if we're looking at what the readme needs to be doing, it needs to be that signpost, that gateway of where people can go, where all the information is, so people have all of the information which they need in order to make sure that they're solving the problems which the Autumn Project is doing. And with that, thank you very much for your time. If you ever would like some documentation advice or me to look at or support or send um, how I share ideas, please do reach out, please do email or tweet me. And with that, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your conference.